Today we're going to do begin with Genesis chapter 2, which we finished the six days of creation. Now we're going to talk about the seventh day, which the interesting thing about the seven, seventh day is uh, he did not say the evening and the morning were the seventh day. No, only up to six. I don't think that was left out for no reason. Mm -hmm. I think what he's saying is every day in the Lord has a beginning and an end. When you move into the, seventh, the first day, which is a day of light, then the light of God has a beginning and an end. He's trying to show us something, and when we see what he's trying to show us, then he wants us to uh, do something about it. It's like an assignment. Okay, here's the light of God for your life. Now, and, and, you know, we do that. We say that in our prophecy all the time, seek first the kingdom. Go ahead. And I imagine a lot of people see that as a sentiment rather than an assignment. Right. It needs to be viewed differently. That's what Peter, remember in John 21, uh, Jesus told uh, Peter, do you love me? Yeah. And he, ex he responded with a sentiment that Jesus was saying, no, I know you have a sentiment of love toward me. But are you going to fulfill your assignment? Hmm. Seeking the kingdom involves an assignment. It's not about, Peter kept answering him in John 21. Well, Lord, you know I love you. Mm -hmm. I've loved you my whole life. <laughs> well, you know, there's a lot of honky-tonk, uh, beer-drinking, women-chasing uh, rednecks that have a sentiment of seek the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Lord, you know I love you. You know, you know where did I put my cowboy boots, you know? No reflection on rednecks. Oh. <laughs> but just making the point. There's a lot of people who, it's like, what I think 70% uh, or no, it's got to be higher. I think it's like 80% of people in America say, well, of course I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian, yeah. And, uh, but I think it's a sentiment. But it's not a sentiment, it's an assignment. And just like every day of the Lord, we studied last week, the six days of creation had a beginning and an ending. Okay, what's your assignment? Well, the first day, God wants you to see something. The second day, he wants you to say something. The third day, he wants you to commit something. The fourth day, he wants you to receive something. That's your destiny. Receive your destiny. The fifth day, he wants you to sow something. That's when he gave sowing and reaping. So let's go back over that. The first day, he see. wants you to see something. That's your assignment. See. The second day, that's when he, he dealt with the waters. He wants you to say something, the water of the word. Right. The third day was a day of bringing all the waters together. Commit. He wants you to commit something, to clarify that word on the inside of you. The fourth day was the day of uh, um, moving into destiny. A destiny. He wants you to receive your destiny. Receive. He wants you to receive something. And the fifth day was about multiplication. It's the first time you mentioned multiplication. It's the day of grace. He wants you to sow something. You know, to begin to reap the harvest of that which you sow. And so, uh, and then the sixth day. He wants you to be something. To sow and then be. Mm -hmm. to, he, he made man, made him the apogee of his creation, the zenith. He's the, man was the capstone. Jesus is the capstone of eternity. Man was the capstone of creation. Do something with what he gave. Yeah, he wants us to go be something. Right. You know? <clears throat> and, uh, but the seventh day mm -hmm. has no beginning and no end. It's like rest, the day of rest is not an assignment, it's a it's a state. 
of being. It's a uh, it has no no beginning and it has no ending. You know, it's like when you were what is it you used to tell your kids when you uh, were provided daycare and they didn't want to take a nap. Well, you don't have to go to sleep. You just need to lay down and rest. And pretty soon they were all asleep. <laughs> just rest. So it's like, if you go, and I do that a lot, you know, because I know if I don't take a little short nap during the day, right. then at night I'm going to be exhausted and won't be able to stay awake. Yeah. And uh, But many times I've gone in and laid down, and like I've assigned myself, you're going to go, take a 20 minute nap and I lay down and every process in my mind goes off like fireworks Right. because I've given myself an assignment. Rest is not an assignment. <laughs> but, you know, to, if, if rest is an assignment, those concepts are mutually exclusive of one another. Now, you go lay down and take a nap, like that's the way a dad puts kids down. You go lay down and take a nap and go to sleep or I'm going to spank you. <laughs> Yikes. Well, the last thing kids are going to do is, is take a nap. Then. And uh, we talked about uh, the sixth day was a day of finishing. Mm -hmm. The Lord, he finished all those, all those things and he created man. And so now in, uh, read, I guess, let me see, read the first... Read the first four verses. I think it's good. Okay, this is Genesis chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord made the earth and the heavens. You can learn a lot about God's. I always love to study God from the perspective of let me learn what kind of a person he is. You know, we tend to get so overwhelmed with the idea of God that we, we, we turn our brains off. And we don't stop to learn. It's as though I think sometimes people think that they're being disrespectful. It's like how in, in human history, when you're around somebody who's higher than you, mm -hmm. the universal response is you lower your eyes. You know, you don't, you can't look at them, bow your head. Wow. Because you don't have the authority or the right to look at them. Mm -hmm. But God wants us to see him. And so I love to study. I've done a lot of studies on Jesus. We know so much about him, probably more than any other character in the Bible. We, we can read in the Gospels about Jesus. And if you study his, the psychology of Christ, mm -hmm. what he was like, and uh, how he thought, why he did what he did. And there are some astounding things you can learn uh, by doing that. And that's not the purpose of today's study. But to study God, how does God get things done? Ephesians, I think it's chapter 5, no, 6, verse 1 says, Be ye followers of God as dear children. Mm -hmm. And the word there means imitator. Well, think about uh, the great imitators, people who imitate other, like Elvis impersonators. Sure. You know, they have to study the people they're impersonating. And you have to know something about them. And if we're supposed to be a follower, and the word there is imitator of God, and, and it's not an illegitimate way to look at that, to say we're supposed to impersonate God. <laughs> wow. In a situation, okay, what did God do when he wanted to get something done? Well, he said something, he called something, he divided something, he multiplied something, and he finished something. Mm-hmm. Do that. Be See? imitators of God. <laughs> I mean, this is like uh, Genesis 1 and 2 is like a template, even dealing with uh, rebellious children. You know, I, I think we talked about that last week, how in conversation, how that 
there's a time in my life my kids were not, you know, real sterling examples of piety and, <laughs> and which, you know, rambunctious kids going through puberty and going through those difficult teenage years. And I felt bad because as a pastor, you know, people look at you, well, if your kids aren't glowing in the dark, memorizing scripture and looking like little cherubs, then you just don't have the authority to be a pastor because you don't rule your own house well. Oops. <laughs> and I was really convicted about that and thinking because I, I did everything I needed to do. And one day the Lord spoke to me and says, yeah, I have trouble with my kids too. Mm -hmm. I guess they relate as a father. Yeah, and he told me, he said, I guess that means I'm not, I'm not fit to rule the universe. <laughs> Should I tender my resignation? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so we can study how God, it's Kenneth Hagin, I learned that from him. He said one time he was pastoring in Texas and something was going on in the church. And they said, uh, well, Pastor Hagin, and I heard this on the radio when he was still on the radio, Kenneth Hagin Sr. Pastor Hagin, what are we going to do in the board meeting? And mm -hmm. He said, well, we're going to do what God would do if he were in our position. We're just going to act like the word's true, whether mm -hmm. we feel it or not. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you don't feel like it. That's where faith comes in. Yeah. Feeling and faith have nothing to do with one another. Oh, no. And, uh, but it says he finished, and I love to do word studies. Finished. It means to accomplish, to cease, to consume, to determine, to end, to finish, to be complete, to be accomplished, to be at an end, to be finished, to be spent. And uh, that's interesting. Although that doesn't apply to our God. He's not spent. Well, but he spent his, he spent himself. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he I believe it was true, and although he's undiminishable, right. but yet he spent himself on creation. And uh, of course, it's impossible to tap. But we think of spending, we think of something limited. And well, uh, maybe if you think uh, I have to go buy a new appliance, then I the money I set aside, I spent. And it was for something that was good, and it was something. So he took the some energies and spent. Yeah. yeah. And there's a and it's a sense of accomplishment. There there comes a point, and I think younger generations, unfortunately, older generations understood something. I'm talking about even beyond our generation. They mm -hmm. understood something about prayer that that the kids that grew up in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and 90s. There's a lot that has been lost because there was a time on the earth when the, the piety of previous generations was much stronger and they actually understood something, things about God that are almost lost information now. And one of them is prayer. And, and you know how much I've, when you start losing prayer, you fall into religious pretense of prayer mm -hmm. because you know you're supposed to pray, so you have this pretense of prayer, and you lose the substance of it. And mm -hmm. I always love getting around somebody. I know when I get around somebody who knows how to pray, you can tell without ever hearing them pray. Mm -hmm. And that's the one I want to pray for me. That's right. And one of the things the old timers knew about that I was just fortunate because of how I grew up, I was around a lot of these people, and they knew something called praying through. They actually use the term, pray through to the assurance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and they prayed differently. When they would start praying, there would come a point that they had prayed it through, and that's where you would say, oh, we're going to pray all night. Well, if you're not praying through something, I don't think you're not going to be heard for your much speaking. Uh, it's like having a baby. You can have two I've never had a baby, but I know you can have two hours labor. Or twelve, <laughs> or twenty-nine. It could take as it takes as long as it takes. Mm -hmm. It's 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 not like the quality of the outcome. A satisfactory outcome doesn't have to do with how long it takes. It has to do with a healthy baby with ten toes and ten fingers, right. and everything's okay. 
um, one of my pastors in Missouri uh, said one time his mama was a woman of prayer and he said mama would have her apron on and she'd be in the kitchen and working and all of a sudden she'd get this look on her face she'd untie her apron and she'd say I'm going to pray and she'd go way out in the field and pray until she was content she was satisfied yeah. and he said it was such a learning tool for him to watch his mama pray like that. And we have to do that. I, I've always used the term when I pray like that. I call it putting it to bed. Mm -hmm. My heart's troubled. My dad, tremendous lesson he taught me as a young man. Of course, growing up, the pressures of family. Mm -hmm. And I'd go to him and I'd get, well, today, they say I was depressed. Mm -hmm. And you might go to the doctor, well, they want to put you on Paxil, Prozac, <laughs> uh, Effexor, you know, one of these th these medications to help you. And uh, Dad said, uh, and I asked my dad one time, I was heavy hearted, please pray for me. I, I just feel like the devil's on my case and I can't shake this. And he asked me a couple of questions. He says, well, maybe it's not the devil at all. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's God moving you to pray. Absolutely. And that really helped me, and, and I learned to tell the difference. There are times when it's just the devil on your case, yeah. but there were also times that I felt like, no, this is not the devil. Yeah, it's a burden. This is God, God moving me to pray, mm -hmm. and I know that place. And and then I go put that to bed. I'd have to get on my face and pray until I put it to bed. Mm -hmm. I think many people today are getting prescriptions from their doctors to relieve a prayer burden. Wow. Wow, I wish that could be taught. And it's the same thing about uh, fasting. Man, I have a hard time fasting. I try and fast. And like John Wimber said, it's not fast, it's slow. slow. <laughs> <laughs> and my daddy taught me, he said, he said, look, if you get up and you're not hungry, then don't eat. Mm -hmm. And if that turns into a fast, then that's okay. There's, there's a grace. You have to find grace to fast. And if you're trying to fast and you're just devastated by hunger, maybe that's... And you have to be careful because Jesus said, uh, told the Pharisees, he said, while the bridegroom is with them, they're not going to fast. But when the bridegroom's taken away, then shall they fast. And, okay, well, Jesus is the bridegroom. He lives in our heart. Has he been taken away from me? Oh, no. And so fasting in the New Covenant is different from fasting in the Old. And I think people, that's a whole other conversation of people not understanding fasting. But verse 2 says, on the seventh day, God ended his work. You have to end some things. It's like, oh, I put that to bed. Mm -hmm. It's finished. You have to pray through the finished work. There's a understanding of that, the finished work of Calvary. In, the, in Isaiah, he said, by his stripes you are healed. So the saints look forward to a present tense healing. But when Peter quoted it in 1 Peter 2.24, he said, by his stripes you were healed. Mm -hmm. So the Old Testament saints looked forward to the cross. We look back to the cross as a finished work. Mm -hmm. And you have to be careful how you, how you ask God. I think we we portray our ignorance in prayer. God, if you would just heal. Mm -hmm. oh, I did that 2,000 years ago. Yeah. And you have to pray your way into the finished work of Calvary. Not casting away your confidence yeah. that he will do what he said he would do. It's like if you buy your 16-year-old your brand new car and hand him the keys, and the keys are in his room on his dresser, and he gets out of bed the next morning. I'm running late. I need you to take me to school. Would you please take me to school? Can I have the car so I go to school? Son, the keys are on your dresser. <laughs> it's full of gas. Go to school. Go to school. <laughs> you know. So it requires action on our part. I really got that last year. About how he's called the comforter, which means paraclete. That's the Greek word paraclete, and it's a long definition. It means one brought alongside together against. Mm -hmm. The very definition of who he is when he sent the comforter, I'm sending someone to come alongside you 
together with you mm-hmm. against. If it's not, everything God does is together with us. But the word seven there, mm-hmm. I love to study numbers in the Bible. The word seven comes from a root word meaning covenant. And, and that number is so interesting. There are seven, here's the seventh day. And we could study the seven days of creation just by numbers. It's very interesting. Uh, but the seventh, the seventh day. By that, do you mean like numbers one to seven? Yeah, one, one through seven. seven. One. And study, oh, study the root word. The, and the root word was the word that was used before that was a number. Okay. okay. For instance, seven, again, comes from a root word meaning covenant. And if and there's certain facts about seven, for instance, there are only seven bodies in the solar system that uh, that you can see with the visible eye. You can see stars, but there's only seven bodies that you can see with the naked eye, like the planets. Only seven. There are seven seas, seven continents. Mm-hmm. Uh, psychologists tell us that there are seven things you can hold in your active memory at any given time. They call it the magical number seven. That's amazing. When you talk about multitasking, you, you, the average person can only multitask seven things at one time if he really mm-hmm. tries hard. Wow. And uh, there were, se- uh, see, there's seven churches, seven. Uh, Seven sisters, seven candlesticks. When the Bible talks about the stars, it talks about the seven sisters, mm-hmm. which are in one of the constellations. And uh, it's just such an, an interesting word. And it has to do with completion, perfection. And uh, so on the seventh day, he rested and ended his work. Now, this is another interesting thing. Let me see if I can bring it up. Yes. There were seven sayings of Jesus. Oh, on the cross. On the cross. That's right. You mentioned that. And it occurred to me when I was looking at seven, so okay, let's compare that to the seven days of creation. And see if that says anything does. The first day is a day of light. Okay. Okay. And you can help me out with this because I know you've been making notes. I have. So we can refer to these days. Okay. So the seven days of creation, because Jesus was doing something creatively, Second Corinthians tells us that we're new creations in Christ Jesus. Well, when did he do that? On the cross. So there were seven things that Jesus did and seven things that God did. Okay. And so if the first day is a day of light, light, which means he wants to put an image on the inside of us. Mm -hmm. He wants us to see something. The first saying of Jesus on the cross is Luke 23, 34, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Hmm. So what's the first mark of illumination? If the first day is a day of light, God said, let there be light. If we connect that with the seven sayings of Jesus, is let there be forgiveness. Forgiveness would be number one. Wow. And, and Jesus said, if your uh, eye be single, your whole body is full of light. Mm-hmm. What kind? What light? Is it the light, doctrinal light, of how many angels can dance on the head of a pen? Mm-hmm. No. It's a light of forgiveness. It says, but if thine eye be not single, your whole body is full of darkness. So letting scripture interpret scripture, even in the metaphor of creation, uh-huh. you can equate light with forgiveness. That's good. And if you're not forgiving, there's darkness in you. I don't care how illuminated theologically you think you are. Right. you got to start at the top. Yeah. God starts out. The beginning of everything he does has to do with forgiveness. And we're going to study more whenever we get into Noah and start looking at the rainbow and the seven colors of the rainbow, which are the seven spectrums of visible light as they relate to the seven spirits of God in Isaiah 11. Mm-hmm. And if you realize that all of them, when you blend all of them together into the full spectrum of visible light, when he created the earth, it has to do with forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Walking in forgiveness. That just so totally speaks to me. Because if you don't have love, mm-hmm. how dwelleth 
the love of, if you're not forgiving your brother, how dwells the love of God in you? And think about it, the all-knowing God, knowing when he created all that he did, and he then created man in that, knowing with foresight that he was going to sin and turn his back on him, he still walked in forgiveness before he ever created. Yeah. He the, had yeah. it in him. Hello. Well, the very act of creation was an act of forgiveness because he knew what man was going to do. He knew. And that's where he told me years ago when we went to IHOP Mission Space one time about if he said, when I look at you, Russ, I see the lamb. But I want you to look at others and see the lamb. Mm -hmm. He said, to the degree that you look at others and see the lamb of God, that is the exact degree that you enjoy the benefits of the fact that yes. that's how I see you. Yes. Amen. God sees us that way even if we're unforgiving. That's right. He looks at us and he sees the lamb. But he, but, but we don't enjoy the benefits of that unless we're looking at others the same way. That restrains his blessing. Mm -hmm. Because he's, he's in he's, him is light and there is no darkness. His forgiveness. He's not going to take that darkness in. How come you're not answering my prayer, God? Okay, when you look at so-and-so, so and so, you know, you look at somebody repugnant in your life. Well, they're sinners. Really? Is that what you see? <laughs> well, the degree to which you see that is the degree to which you are excluded from the benefits of the fact that when I look at you, I see the light. Dear Lord. Because God don't walk in darkness. Mm -mm, he can't. And if we're walking in darkness, darkness is, is not theological misunderstanding. Darkness is not... Uh, believing something unorthodox, like somebody who doesn't believe in the Trinity or doesn't right. believe in, in different things. That's not darkness. Darkness is not intellectual. It's a heart matter. It's not walking in forgiveness. Yeah, and how great is that darkness? Now, the, the second day of creation is, was, had to do with the word, he, the waters that he was dealing with. Right. So the first day he says something, and what he's saying is forgive. That's Jesus on the cross. And the second day, the first day he wants us to see something. The second day he wants us to say something. And uh, and the second saying of Jesus is, Truly I say unto you, this day you will be with me in paradise. So if the first day has to do with, if you compare it to the seven sayings of Jesus, the first thing has to do with forgiveness and seeing. He made light, mm -hmm. see, having forgiveness. The second day has to do with uh, all of your actions, all of the words of your mouth, portraying the fact that you're with him today, being with him. That's the word. Secure. Yeah, it's the word Se of it's security. the word of acceptance. I accept you. You're with me. Fear not. What is the word? The word casts out fear. Mm -hmm. And many people, why do they? have fear in their lives, or why do they think their prayers aren't going to get answers? Because they don't think they're with God. They don't feel accepted. So mm -hmm. the word is, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. Mm -hmm. And many times people, the word they get is, you know, like Moses casting down the tablets, but that's Old Covenant. The New Testament word is, I will never leave you, I'll never forsake you, I love you. Yeah, he did the work. We don't yeah. do the work. <laughs> and of course, religious people hate that. You gotta be holy. Well, you can't be holy unless he's with you. Mm -hmm. It's like which comes first, the chicken yeah. or the egg? Gotcha. The acceptance of God comes before you can ever have the opportunity to to walk in an approved way before Him. God is a holy God, but He's a forgiving God first, and then when you see Him, you'll be like Him. The only thing that makes us like God is not obedience. Doesn't make us like God. Obedience isn't even possible until we see Him. So people don't want to give the un I don't want to give the unconditional acceptance of God because people will keep on sinning. Really? The Bible says when you see him you'll be like him and they'll know you're my disciples by your love one for another. That's one thing that breaks my heart about Christians. You get around Christians and they're bickering, fighting, stabbing one another, putting each other down, disagreeing and arguing. Everywhere you go, you see this. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Christians will argue at the drop of a hat, and uh, because the we, our culture, the religious culture, is more intellectual belief, theological belief, than it is real spiritual experience. And uh, 
why don't people say, well, those Christians are just so loving? I so appreciate the, the love that they have. Now, the third day, it's interesting, the third day was when he clarified the waters, gathered the waters together into one place. How he set things in order. Well, his third saying on the cross was, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. What did he do? He put his family in order. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's it's there's a there's a correlation there, and and that's interesting to me because they were John and Mary were not related. Right. So when he like we talked about on the third day, how he eliminates all the other streams. There are many streams of thought that run through us. Many of them that are, give authority to circumstance, and you. You let circumstance and experience speak with a greater authority than God's word. God's word said he came that you might have life and life more abundantly. But your experience is you're on food stamps, broke, busted, downhearted, disgusted, unhappy, perturbed. And you let that speak with greater authority than his word. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but there's also that factor in the authority of his word, how relational Jesus was in the seven sayings. Everything he says on the cross of the seven sayings are relational because faith works by love. We tend to want to get it, me, just me and Jesus got our own thing going. Mm -hmm. Jesus connects it. To family. So John was only a son to Mary in Christ. Mary was only a mother to John in Christ. Mm -hmm. To be brothers and sisters. Jesus had this relationship, this fam family of God in his mind, which is just something that... Uh, it, at times, it's it's very. There's a lot of uh, um, there's a lot of pathos in thinking about that, because I remember as a young man, a young pastor, how how idealistic I was about the family of God. I was pastoring a church, <coughs> and my family, I had no family near me, not even five states away. I didn't have any family anywhere near me. Right. And uh, back then, we didn't have the internet. And, you couldn't stay in touch. And so the church was my family. Right. And I sold myself to that concept that these are my brothers. These are my sisters. Uh, I'm going to, Jesus said, who's my mother? Who's my, my brother? Mm -hmm. I've said that so much that my natural family, that's a standing joke when I get around them. That's right. They'll quote that, mm -hmm. you know, because I, they knew I lived my life that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, would you uh, remind me again his third statement exactly how Jesus said that? He said, My woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. Okay. And so it's the, the family. I think it's one of the manifestations of when you let God clarify his truth on the inside of you to bring all the waters in you together where it's just the word of God speaking with authority to you. Then you're in a position. How many times we see broken relationships in the church, and a lot of people won't go to church mm -hmm. because they're tired. It's like I've asked that question. If you want to be accepted, where, where can you be accepted unconditionally? Uh, the bar or the church? The bar. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and and it's, it's so true. It's, it's just a real lack. It's sad that people put of, a, of acceptance. Yeah. In the church, sometimes the best you can hope for in a lot of churches is just benign neglect, you know, mm -hmm. where you go there for a year and nobody even shakes your hand. And uh, and I think that's why people many times like being in great big churches, they because you can just, you just go in. be blend in and you know receive some inspiration and go home. Because spiritual family is too painful, right. and I understand that. But Jesus wants us to see. I I believe that the gold standard of relationship is in Christ is when you look at your brother and you look at your sister and you say what Jesus said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. We have a friend like that. Mm -hmm. And and she's proven That's right. over the years that we've known her. That's right. And not only with us, but she does it with other people in her life. She's one of these, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake Committed you kind of people. Friends. And I don't really know anybody else like her. And, uh, but it's, kind of, it's a blessing to see that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the next statement Jesus made, my God, my God, why hast thou 
forsaken me. And that speaks directly to the fourth day of creation, which has to do with destiny. Moving into destiny. The fourth day, and we won't go back over it because we taught it last week, but the fourth day of creation was when he made the stars, and he told Abraham, your children would be as the stars. And the word star is where the word destiny, it means destarred. It has to do with destiny. You have a destiny in God. Jesus was forsaken. So that we could be, so accepted. That we could be accepted and have a destiny. But it's interesting, he dealt with acceptance and and commonality in the first one. Like is it Before, many people want to pursue their destiny in God, but they don't understand that Jesus has a higher priority. Before he dealt with that, he wants to give you family, a mom and a dad in the spirit, mm -hmm. a brother and a sister. I think it breaks the heart of God that we don't have more brotherly love. If you study in the first Peter, second Peter chapter, one, chapter two, where it talks about brotherly love. Let brotherly love continue. And sad, it's a sad fact we do not have that in yeah. the body of Christ. And it's sad that we don't. I think we've experienced some of that in media church and in Father Sark ministry, people that have connected with us. I feel that. Mm -hmm. I've, I've probably experienced more, more of that kononia, that yeah. New Testament yeah. word, in what we're doing now. Than we had in all our church relationships. Than many church relationships coming mm -hmm. up. And I, I can appreciate that. Uh, but I think it's even that, as wonderful as it's been, been, I think it's quite anemic compared to the koinonia that Jesus paid for. What he's talking about, yeah. He paid for something robust. Mm -hmm. He paid for something that would stand the test of time and pressure. And uh, mm -hmm. it just really speaks to my heart. And then when you have spiritual family, then you move into destiny. He was forsaken. And I don't think he was kidding when he said it. Yeah. I believe at that moment he was forsaken. Sure. He had to be. He had to really. People, when you get into the theology of it, they think he was faking. Oh, no. You know, There's no fake in him. He was just pretending to die. He just swooned on the cross because you can't kill God. Oh, come on. You know, he's God. And so they start splitting theological hairs and they wind up, like, for instance, the uh, people, and I don't agree or disagree with them, but the people that teach there is no trinity, they say that he was God and man on the earth. They said what, what he did is that before the human body died that Jesus walked around in, the God part of him left. The God part of him left him to die. Well, if that's true, then you don't have God dying for your sins. You don't have Jesus dying for your sins. Right. He didn't make an exit early. Which is interesting because... He, of, the, go ahead. The, he said, it, Nobody, no man took it from me. I laid it down. Yeah, I exactly. I laid it down. I gave it up. And if you think about that and you look at those people that have that doctrine, they're very legalistic people. They live under the law. Which is interesting because they don't have a Jesus really dying for them. They, they say he basically pulled a parlor trick mm. and only appeared to die. Heartbreaking. And then they keep themselves under the law. So that tells me there's a spirit of error because there's a there's method to their madness because they really theologically don't have a Jesus dying for them and they're still under the law, which if Jesus hadn't have died, we would be under the law, and they are. And I, I, <laughs> that's just a whole other conversation, but we have a destiny. He was rejected despised, forsaken, so that we could be accepted, honored, and approved. No strings attached. You know. mm -hmm. And it just really speaks to me. The fifth thing. And then the fifth day, having to do with grace, multiplication, he said, I thirst. <laughs> you know, that really touches my heart. The cry of God. What is thirst? It's barrenness. Barrenness, nothing there for you. Even the creature comforts his body, what it cost him upon the cross. And you compare that to the fifth day of creation, which is grace. Number five is the number of grace. It's the number, it's the day that he first mentioned multiplying, be fruitful, multiply. Mm -hmm. And then Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And here we go. The, the sixth day when he made man, he breathed into man. Man became a living soul. 
And he says, I, and, but yet it's like when God gave us his spirit, Jesus released his spirit. It's like Jesus, the seventh, on, on the sixth day, he's releasing his spirit back to God. And on the sixth day of creation, God was imparting his spirit to us that we might live. The finishing anointing is what I have down for the sixth day, too. Yeah. Yeah, that was it. Mm -hmm. And then the very last thing he said, it is finished, corresponds to the seventh day when it says the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. Wow. We really do need to have an understanding of the finished work mm -hmm. of Calvary. I think many of our needs, we need to learn to pray over them and say, it is finished. Agree with God. You know, whether it's financial need, broken homes, broken bodies, it is finished. Yeah, that's, mm, that's good. That's really good. And then entering into rest, and he blessed the seventh day, and he sanctified it. That word sanctify means to be set apart. And, and you know, back in uh, the early days of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, they tried to set up a 10-day work week. Yeah, because they were just, it's communism, they're trying to do things better, and they rejected a seven-day week because that was part of the Gregorian calendar rooted in in religion. And so they said, we're going to do away with that. We'll have a 10-day work week. Yikes. And everything broke down. Machines broke down. Men broke down. Productivity was lost. They found that man was created for a six-day work week. They didn't recognize creation, but they had to go back to it because it just wasn't working. <laughs> the principle of it, huh? You know, and the whole principle of rest, Hebrews 4 talks about that, you know, God prepared a rest for us. God is not wanting to put us to work. He's wanting to bring us to rest. But rest is not inactivity because on the seventh day, everything he did didn't grind to a halt. And here's the thing about studying the character of God. What does it mean, rest? It means you put he put his faith out there and established all of these processes by his words and he spoke and he created and he spoke and he created it and he and those things continue to go on mm -hmm. and then eventually the seventh day he comes back and it's just he's letting those processes work and yet creation continues yeah. to expand so there's something you're supposed to do yes we enter into God's process we're supposed to see something say something commit something uh, receive something receive our destiny you know to finish the work, enter into the finished work, and then when you do those things, those things constitute spiritual processes that that are working as you enter into rest and relationship with God. I, I remember God telling me one time, he said, he said, when are we going to get past daily bread? Mm -hmm. How come every time the Lord told me, he says, how come every time you come to me, we're talking about daily needs? Mm -hmm. When can we just establish that and just you and I have a father-son talk? He said, that is so boring, <laughs> you know. And one time he told me, he says, uh, uh, when are we going to have a conversation that doesn't deal with your unbelief, for us?" That's pretty heavy, huh? Can't we get past that? Have I not taken care of you these many years? That's right. How old are you going to have to be before you just get it? You know, it reminds me, we share often, you share with people about um, you have an assignment, and an assignment has a beginning and an end. Same is true with this process that we've been discovering. It's a process, and when you get that concerning whatever it is, maybe a, s a certain child or whatever, you go through that process with the Father until you come to this finishing place. But it, it has a beginning and an end. It, how long it takes is up to us. <laughs> how long are we going to hold on to it and not yield to the process. And that's where in the seventh days, the scripture says, this is the day that the Lord hath made, I'll rejoice and be glad in it. Jesus spoke continually about the first watch, the third watch. He always talked about, the Lord told me many times in prophecy, he says there's 24 hours in that day. And you need to know, there is such depth of understanding and there's 24 elders around the throne and there's mm -hmm. those things all mean something. And 24 ribs in the human body. He's talking to us. He's trying to get us to understand. And you need to know, you tell people, okay, seek the kingdom. All right, what day are they in? 
And sometimes they have to answer that. And if you don't care enough to find out, you're going to just wander around in this general malaise of spiritual misunderstanding, and God will just have mercy on you and get you through to the end of your life. But there's so much more information available if we'll just seek it. So what day are you in? Seek first the kingdom. Okay, what day am I in? You're in day one. God wants you to see something. I think that's a big part of the job of the prophet. I look at somebody and I see their potential. And if I speak to their potential, they'll either get mad. Or they'll get it. Or they'll get it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. A lot of people don't, or they want to see, don't see the forgiveness. Forgive, release, bless. One of our mentors talked so much about that. Yeah. And uh, so if you're in that day, it's a day you need to see something. You don't need to go saying something. It's stupid to say something before you see something. You're supposed to say what you see. So you can't go to the second day of receiving the word, the proceeding word from God, until you first see something. And sometimes seeing something takes a while. You know, I know it took me a long time to see properly. And when he finally did, when God finally showed me what he was going to do with my life, it scared me. And I mean, I wept, I cried, because I knew I was so far from it. That I had not not that whether or not it would happen. I knew it was going to happen, but I also knew that my life was going to be completely decompiled before mm -hmm. I got there. And the fear of that, I knew that everything I'd worked so hard for was going to be completely deconstructed, and God was going to, even though He promised me the outcome, yeah. I didn't know if I was going to endure. We're it. shaking to the core. I didn't know if I was, I could take it. Mm -hmm. I I was afraid I was going to mess it up. Wow. But when you see it. Then you say it, and we had the little flip chart you and I would use for years. Mm -hmm. You know, all this, we have a ministry together, you know, and all those things. We are marketplace apostles. We are, and we flip through about 20 different things every day. And we're walking in it. And how long do I have to say this? There's a time when your confession needs to come out of your mouth, and then there's a time when it carries you. It's like, okay, I confessed, and then you get in the second day where he brings all the waters together. He starts exposing all the things in you. It's like, I lived my life for many years, and still today, I only do what I see my father do. God wanted me to see that, and I said it for a long time. And then one day, so I saw it, then I said it, and then one day he dealt with me. He said, well, let's clarify those waters. You can do a lot of things you don't see me do. You can lie. You can cheat. You can hate. Mm -hmm. You can sin. And so then I had to begin to repent and say, Father, I'm here. First of all, I want to say, I can do many things I don't see you do. Mm -hmm. And would you clarify those waters in my heart so that I don't do that anymore? And then I began to walk in the destiny, day four of that. I saw John 5.19. I said John 5.19 for many years before it was perfected in my life. Then he refined John 519 on the inside of me and exposed all the things in my life that I wasn't doing what I seen my father do. But then the fourth day, I began to walk in the destiny of it, and it began to do powerful things in my life. And then on the fifth day, it produced. Seriously. And I seriously began to walk. It's still producing. <laughs> and uh, that's a perfect example of the seven days of creation. So we just got to know what day we're in. Yeah. And, and, when, and, it's, and, and of course, they repeat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Assignments, beginning like, and end. We've went through that. God told me last year. Last year, okay, you can keep going right like things are now, or I could take you to the next level. Mm -hmm. And so you go from day one to day seven, and day seven is a day of rest, and you're just kind of coasting on everything God is doing. Doesn't that feel good? Isn't that creamy <laughs> to your spirit? It's just okay. Are you ready to go again? All right, I want you to see something, and it it feels like square one again. Yeah. Okay, I don't want you to say something. Now let's clarify those waters and get rid of the unbelief. Now I want you to see your destiny. Let's multiply it. <laughs> let's finish the work. Okay, take a rest. Let's start over. Yeah. And that's where Thank the Bible God. talks about from glory to glory. Faith to faith. And many people read that, and it's, it's like poetry to the glory to glory. Oh, well, you no. This is a very <laughs> it's a process. This is a process. <laughs> But it's rewarding, isn't it? I wish I'd have known it when I was twenty. Yeah, I say that a lot. I deal with a lot of regret of years and immaturity and not knowing it. Breaks my heart. I wish 
It's not God's fault. Oh, yeah. I wish I had prophetic voices speaking into me in my youth that we speak into people's lives now. It would have made a huge difference, I'm certain. But thank God for the prophetic voice. Okay, Pastor Kitty, why don't you pray? Father, we thank you for this. We thank you for sharing that information with Russ about the sayings of Jesus and connecting them to the days of creation. Our prayer is, Father, that we walk it out, that we live it, we breathe it. It is our portion, our daily bread, Father, to look to you for answers, for for um, nourishment, both um, the word, the bread, and the water of your word. Thank you for the privilege, Father, of gathering together in the morning light time that we have together. We ask that you would bless our day in Jesus' name. Amen.